This is one of those programs, the, the, the origin of which um, I love to share because it began uh, with a phone conversation from Washington asking me if I would be willing to have coffee with our guest. Uh, here's uh, the answer. I've never refused to have coffee with anyone. So I was more than happy to have coffee with our guest and was excited to meet him. And when he indicated a willingness to come and share his time and the story of Colonial Williamsburg today, I was, uh, I was very excited. I also want to welcome C-SPAN and, uh, I mean, Brian Lamb was a, was a colleague of mine as the United States Press Secretary way back when, and he is the guy that started C-SPAN. It's one of the most remarkable, seriously, one of the mo most remarkable contributions that's ever been made to the dialogue of democracy in this country, and so we're, we're thrilled to have C-SPAN with us. And with that said, let me just say about our guest, he has a 40-year association with Williamsburg. He wasn't born there, but when he was quite young, his family moved there, and he married a woman from Williamsburg. I think it's fantastic. His book is The Idea of America. We have copies that will be sold afterwards. He'll be happy to sign. So join with me as we give a special welcome to a special person, Dr. William White, historian from the Williamsburg Foundation. Thank you all very much. I am really pleased to uh, be here in San Diego and, and yes, to have uh, survived the flood of Denver, um, to actually make it here to San Diego. Um, I'm also very conscious of the fact that uh, everyone's had their lunch, that in San Diego it's an absolutely beautiful day outside and they've asked a historian to speak. So um, we'll, uh, we'll try and keep this moving and keep it lively. What I'd like to do is try and knit together several different things, and, and uh, one of those, of course, is the place that I work at and love, Colonial Williamsburg. How, how many folks have actually been to Colonial Williamsburg? Oh, that's wonderful. So if you have not been to Colonial Williamsburg, I need to help you imagine this place, because it really is kind of remarkable. Um, so you have to imagine a place that's a mile long from the Capitol building on this end of the Duke of Gloucester Street, to uh, the College of William and Mary on this end of the Duke of Gloucester Street. And then in that mile long space, think three streets wide, okay? That's the museum. And everywhere you go in that mile long, three street wide area, you've stepped into the past. You've time traveled. You can find the shoemakers and the, and the uh, founders you can find the house rights. You can visit George Wythe's house, signer of the Declaration of Independence and the law teacher for Thomas Jefferson. You can travel through the governor's palace. You can see the Capitol building where some very remarkable things happen. Um, now, living history museums have uh, gained over time what I think is, um, I'm beginning to think of as a bad rap uh, because we we start to think about living history museums as being those nice, nostalgic places where you travel back in time. Let's just escape the 21st century and we'll go back in time to a place where everything was simpler, everything was less difficult, the technology was easier to deal with. Um, and they've never been that for me. They've always been much more exciting than that. And I think that when you actually take yourself back to the time of the revolution, you realize what a remarkable vital time it was and, and how that time is just as difficult and hazardous and just as inspiring as the times we live in today. Um, the other thing I want to try and uh, connect to this, um, and, and so Colonial Williamsburg has, um, has for that reason started to describe itself as a center for history and citizenship where learning the stories of the past help inform us about our citizenship today. And as a part of that initiative, we have, uh, uh, we've just published this uh, book called The Idea of America, along with two co-authors, um, uh, one of whose, uh, uh, Mike Cartunian, um, had this remarkable idea that you could 
take a framework and look at American history consistently um, in some really great ways that allow you to also then turn around and look at citizenship today. And so that framework we'll come back to in just a few minutes, and I'm going to try and tie that together with uh, Colonial Williamsburg and the story of the American Revolution. And I'm going to try and do it all in a few minutes. So we'll see how that goes. Okay? Um, the first thing I want to do is take you to Williamsburg in the 1760s. And what we're going to do is try and, uh, let me try and, and tell you a couple of stories here about the revolution as it comes on in the 1760s, 1770s, and 1780s, and how that shapes who we are as a people. Now, language is critically important when you look at the American Revolution. The story is actually in the language. And in, the 17, in 1768, there was a group of gentlemen who met in this building. This is what the Capitol building looked like in 1768. They met here as the House of Burgesses, Virginia's legislative body. Now, uh, what's going on in, in 1768? Do we know? Oh, come on. We got all these high school history students here. 1760, 1768. 1765 is the Stamp Act. You remember that one? Americans protest the Stamp Act, um, and it's repealed. But the British Parliament comes back pretty quickly with a different set of, uh, of uh, taxes. These are duties. They're called the Townsend duties. And what the colonists had said was that the Parliament didn't have the right to, um, to tax them internally. No internal taxes. And so Parliament says, sure, fine. We'll repeal the Stamp Act. We'll come up with duties. These are not internal taxes. You can't object to these. And Americans say, well, wait a minute. What we really meant to say is we don't want any taxes at all. OK. Um, and so they begin to protest the Townsend duties. So this group of gentlemen have uh, gathered in Williamsburg. It's the spring of 1768. And in the spring of 1768, they're there in that Capitol building, and they're going to petition, uh, create a, a protest, which is a petition, a memorial, and a remonstrance. They petition the king. They send a memorial to the House of Lords. They remonstrate the House of Commons. Okay. But this petition to the king has some really critical language in it. And I want you to look at it here. The, they're saying, your majesty's most loyal and dutiful subjects, the council and burgesses of Virginia, therefore prostrating themselves at the foot of your throne, most humbly implore your fatherly goodness and protection in the enjoyment of their ancient and inestimable right, a right which they've exercised without interruption and has been frequently recognized and confirmed. Let's think about this language just a minute. They're prostrating themselves before the throne. That's a great mental picture, isn't it? Most humbly implore your fatherly goodness and protection, that patriarchal notion of what a monarch or a king is or should be. And they talk about the enjoyment of their ancient and inestimable rights. Now, Virginia was chartered. It was chartered by kings to be a colony. And in those charters, the kings had said that Virginians would have, Virginians and, and their um, ancestors, their, their, um, um, their children, would always have, always have the, um, the same rights and privileges as anyone living in the, on the island of Great Britain. And so they're saying, you, you gave us these rights and these privileges. Now you're talking about taking them back. But we've exercised these rights and privileges all along, and they've been confirmed by other kings, your predecessors. We demand that you confirm these things also. OK? But think about that language. And I want you to compare that language to this. That all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights, of which, when they enter into the state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity. That's not 10 years later. Not 10 years later. And they have shifted from this notion of being subjects to a king 
A king who believes in the divine right of kings. And in the divine right of kings, God gives rights to kings, and kings dole those privileges and rights out to their subjects. What's given can be taken away. And here in an instant, in 1776, these Virginians take everything, everything that Europeans understand about government, and they flip it 180 degrees. And they say, no, rights are vested in the individual. Individuals give up rights and privileges to a government. What's given can be taken away. Now, it's not like this stuff comes just out of the air. These guys are sitting around the room and one of them says, wow, that's a great idea, let's do that. Philosophers have been talking about this for a long time now. Enlightenment philosophers for a hundred years have been casting this notion that you can reorient the relationship of government to the people and people to their government. The innovation here is that these Virginians at this moment are willing to sit there and say, you know, this isn't just philosophy. We can make this work. We can do this. We can figure out how to make this work. That's the innovation. That is the American Revolution. In an instant, they transform themselves from being subjects, subject to a government, to being citizens, citizens who are self-governed. Well, what's going on all at this period of time, of course, is that the, the Continental Congress is meeting in Philadelphia. Um, you know, we think about our Congress today as being dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> But Congress today has nothing, has nothing on the Continental Congress at all, okay? First off, you can't think about the Continental Congress in the same terms as our Congress today. These are two entirely different organizations. And the Second Continental Congress is sitting in Philadelphia. There are a series of delegations from each of the colonies. And uh, those delegation, the delegation of a colony has one vote, and one vote only. So the delegation can be as small as three people, it can be as large as a half dozen or eight people, it makes no difference. But the delegation has to decide on what their, um, what their um, uh, vote will be. And they really can't decide very much at all because they're all bound to wait for the instructions from their local legislature. And in the spring of 1776, no delegation at the Continental Congress has instructions from their local legislature, home legislature, to make a motion for independence. It's getting talked about a whole lot, but nobody's actually doing anything. The closest you come is North Carolina, and, and in North Carolina, uh, the legislature had told their delegates that, um, that, that they could vote for independence if somebody else proposed it, but under no circumstances would they be able to propose independence on their own? So it's a deadlock. Everybody's waiting for something to happen. And what happens, oddly enough, is not something, is not probably the way that we cast it today in the his, history books. Because we think today about the, these uh, gentlemen who were sitting in home legislators, legislatures or who are sitting up at the... Um, um, up there in Philadelphia, um, uh, making all of these decisions and thinking up all this stuff themselves. But in fact, in Virginia, that's not how it happens at all. They call for a meeting of what uh, will be the Fifth Virginia Convention. Uh, the convention will meet uh, to consider important issues outside of uh, the royal government. They've had these two sort of shadow governments going on, the royal government, and then they've been meeting as a convention on the side. Uh, to do their revolutionary business. Um, so these two sort of organizations are at the same time. They're going to elect delegates to the 5th Virginia Convention. So all around Virginia, um, there are meetings of the, um, um, of the freeholders, and they're selecting their delegates. And so here in James City County is a great example. They elect Robert Nicholas and William Norville, Esquires, and then they go on. They don't just elect their representatives, they go on and instruct them. We therefore do request and instruct you, our delegates, to exert your utmost abilities 
towards dissolving the connection between America and Great Britain totally, finally, and irrevocably. And so when the 5th Virginia Convention meets, it passes the re resolution for independence to make Virginia independent, resolved unanimously that delegates appointed to represent this colony in general Congress, in the Continental Congress, be instructed to propose to that respectable body to declare the United Colonies free and independent states, absolved from all allegiance to or dependence upon the Crown or Parliament of Great Britain. That starts in Williamsburg. Richard Henry Lee is one of the delegates to the Con Virginia delegates to the Continental Congress. He's the one who takes this resolution to the Virginia delegation, and it's the Virginia delegation who makes the first move who puts the proposal for independence on the table. And it starts in Virginia communities, not in the minds of a few highbrow folks. As they um, begin to figure out what they're going to do in Virginia, they've declared themselves independent. Now they need a government. And the first thing they do then is to put together a declaration of rights, a declaration of rights that, that will foreshadow the revolution, it will foreshadow the coming of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. They talk about the fact that they, they make a declaration of inherent rights. Rights are vested in the individual. They talk about the fact that government serves the people. The people do not serve government. Government serves the people. There's no hereditary aristocracy in this new form of government. You can't be born a lord. You can't have your position handed down to you. There's a separation of powers. All power is not vested in one, one uh, part of the government, the executive. It's shared to balance the power and have some checks and balances. They talk about the importance of uh, free elections, of trial by jury, no cruel and unusual punishments. Prohibit general warrants. Um, general warrants were, um, um, were warrants that could be issued on the authority of the king. So. Um, British ship's captains, for example, issued a general warrant whenever they went into a town to impress sailors for the British Navy. It was a pretty common practice, um, and it's one of the complaints that Americans have about uh, the British government. But they could also, a uh, governor could search your papers, a gov governor could uh, uh, commandeer your property based on these general warrants. No general warrants. Talked about freedom of the press talked about civilian control of the military authority, and they talk about freedom of religion. For the first time, freedom of religion. Not toleration of religions, but the freedom of conscience, to follow uh, your conscience in religion. It's a remarkable document, and if you ever get a chance to just uh, go online and take a look at it, read it. Uh, because I think it outlines the values that are distinctively American, the values that we all, every American, cherishes. And you find them all through the document. All men are created equally free. It talks about the enjoyment of liberty. It talks about the freedom of the press. Freedom has always been one of those values that Americans hold dear. It's the watch cry of the revolution, Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me death. They talk about equality. Men are equally free. No hereditary offices. Uh, the equality, equality um, uh, entitled to religion and equality before the law. That equality is one of the things that Americans have always known and cherished. They talk about the good people of Virginia, the Virginians and their posterity. They talk about the fact that power derives from the people and talk about the security of the people, the nation, or the community. They're talking about the unity of that community, that we are one unified group, Americans or Virginians or Californians or San Diegoans. We think about ourselves as being a unified people. And at the same time, we know that there are differences. And even at this time of great unity, and that's what the revolution is trying to be. It's trying to be a unifying factor here. They understand that there are differences, that, uh, that they, they talk about the majority of the community recognizing there is a minority in the community. They talk about differences of reason and conviction. 
controversies between individuals. They're talking about the diversity that makes up our communities in terms of political thought, in terms of religion, in terms of background, in terms of ethnicity. They talk about uh, property, acquiring and possessing property. They talk about being taxed on that property. And they talk about controversies representing property. Property, private wealth, has always been a key, key value for Americans, the right to have that private wealth and to hold it. And at the same time, they talk about government being instituted for the common benefit, the need to defend a free state, things being conduct, uh, conducive to the public wheel. They talk about the mutual duty of all. They're talking about having to build a commonwealth, something that we all have and own and use and work together. They talk about a uniform government. They talk about due process, about trial and impartial juries. And they talk about this issue of no general warrants, the law. The law has always been a critical issue for Americans. We are a people of law. We believe in the rule of law. And these, these uh, 18th century revolting British believed in the rule of law. They also know, though, that law can't stand on its own. And so they talk about justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue. They talk about reason and conviction, and they talk about the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. They're talking about ethics within the community, that the community has to strive to be ethical as well. From these values, every American finds their place. From these values spring a debate about what we will be as a people and how we will govern ourselves. And that debate, has, that debate started before the time of the, of the American Revolution, and that debate continues today, a vital debate. What's interesting about the debate is that these values that Americans all hold dear in many cases are in conflict or tension with each other. And that's where this notion of the idea of America comes from. My colleague and friend uh, Michael Hartunian came up with this framework for looking at these values and how they work with each other. Um, Michael is an uh, is, uh, uh, emeritus, uh, professor emeritus at Hamlin University, uh, a great educator, and has been looking at these tools as a way to work with uh, students in the classroom. And so he and Richard Van Scotter and I uh, began to work on this program to try and, and attach these, this, this framework to these notions of history and see how some of these things play out. Now you first have to accept two things. Num number one, you have to accept the fact that America at its heart and soul is this enduring debate that's been going on since before the revolution that we keep coming back to discuss these issues over and over and over again. And you also have to accept the fact that Americans over time have developed what I would call a democratic mind. What I mean by a democratic mind is we have the ability to hold two ideas, two values in our head at the same time, and we can resolve those two. We will work to resolve those two things, even if it's not possible. We don't think this is a very, um, uh, a very unique thing. We, we think this is pretty commonplace, and we don't pay very much attention to it. And we pretty much ignore it when we do it. And it's a problem that we ignore it because it's a talent. It's a talent that we need to cultivate. And if you don't think that it's unusual, I want you to stop for just a second right now. And I want for you to think about every place in this world right now, at this instant, where someone is dying because they cannot resolve their race, their ethnicity, their religion, their tribe with a nationality. And Americans don't get it. Because we do this stuff every single day. We resolve those kinds of problems and issues and tensions, and we do it for the most part nonviolently. It's a remarkable talent. 
and it exists in, in this debate that we constantly have. We, we talk constantly about the, our love of freedom, individual freedom. It's the watch cry of the revolution, and we also know that we cannot all be completely free. One individual completely free in this room stomps on the rights and privileges of everybody else. And if we're all completely free, we have complete anarchy, and we can't live or exist that way. We know that. We tend to temper our freedom with equality, but we don't, also, we don't believe that we are actually completely equal either. We don't even like each other well enough to be completely equal. We know that there are differences between us, and we celebrate the fact that there are differences between us. We just believe that there's a place where we can get the most individual liberty or freedom, and we can get the most equality, and we argue about where the correct place is. Sometimes we push farther to the side of freedom, sometimes farther to the side of equality. But the debate is always there. We're constantly debating uh, our unity. We are one American people. And as soon as you make the statement, we subdivide ourselves into the smallest possible group you can imagine. We subdivide by our race, by our ethnicity, by our country of origin, by the region of the country we, uh, we live in, by the sports teams that we enjoy, for goodness sakes. And for the most part, we think that that enriches us as a people. That diversity enriches us. But every immigration conversation we have is about how much diversity will it take before we tear that unity apart. It's a constant conversation, a constant debate. We talk about our private wealth and our commonwealth. This, this, is, a, um, this is a debate that was, uh, has been going on all through the Republic. One of the first issues before a new Congress uh, after the Constitution is a national road. Should we tax the private wealth to create a national road that will stretch through Pennsylvania and go out to the West? And boy, if you live in Maryland or Pennsylvania or Ohio, this is a great thing. But if you live in South Carolina, you don't want your private wealth being used for a national road that will uh, benefit those people in the middle of the country and not you. Those conversations are still alive today, and not just in terms of dollars and cents. Education in our country is a private wealth commonwealth issue. We believe that when we educate a child, we create private wealth in the child. We give them the tools that they need to be successful in life, and we also know that an educated citizen is a better citizen of the republic, and we've created in that educated child private wealth and commonwealth resources all at the same time. These values are not just in tension with each other, they have a synergy and work together. And then my final one is law and ethics. We're a nation of laws. We believe in the rule of law. We're the most notorious lawbreakers in the world. Our heroes are lawbreakers. George Washington's a traitor to his king. Abraham Lincoln defies the Supreme Court and suspends habeas corpus. Ro Rosa Parks sits down on a bus. We protest the law almost constantly. We challenge the boundaries of the law constantly. And one of the reasons we challenge the law is because we understand that the law is not necessarily ethical. You only have to go as far as Jim Crow laws to know that. And the civil rights movement of the 50s, 60s, and 70s is about challenging those unethical laws. Ethics on its own doesn't work out very well either. So the temperance movement, temperance movement begins what, in the 1820s, 1830s? Uh, they work for almost 100 years to get prohibition. It's going to solve all the problems of America. It's going to improve family life. It's going to keep all those husbands at home taking care of wives and children. It's going to shut down the prison system uh, all across the United States. And what happens? Lawlessness increases in all of our communities. We have to find the balance between law and ethics. And so this debate, this continuing debate about freedom and equality, unity, diversity, private wealth and commonwealth law and ethics, you can find all through our history. And you can look at the immigration conversation that's going on in the 1830s and 1840s as Catholics begin to move into the country. And Americans are just absolutely convinced it's the end of the world. 
because everybody in 1830 knows that democracy is a Protestant value. And these Catholics who owe their allegiance to an old world monarch in the Pope are never going to understand how to be good democratic citizens. There are riots in Philadelphia over what Bible will be used to, in the public schools. The Protestant Bible or the Catholic Bible? And people are being beaten up and killed in the streets over the issue. We've been debating these kinds of issues over and over and over again in this country. Every generation has to find those answers for themselves. The, the republic is not self-actuating. The republic will not live without a new generation of citizens who understand that they're taking part in this debate, who understand how to be critical about that debate, who understand how to ask the right questions, who understand how to form coalitions with the other like-minded individuals, who understand how to reach across the aisle and listen to what's going on on the other side of the aisle and hear the American values there and appreciate the fact that we're all Americans when we come to that table. We're all trying to achieve what's best for the nation. We're all trying to achieve what's best for our state, what's best for our community. We all believe in the same values. And it doesn't make any difference whether we're talking about immigration or science and technology, how to defend the republic, how we will use our landscape and natural resources. It makes no difference. Every American comes to that discussion with the same basic values. They're engaged in this debate. They're engaged in trying to figure out how for themselves to balance those issues. And without that, without that debate, without the engaged citizens, the republic does not live. So Colonial Williamsburg, using the story of the American Revolution, the resources at hand, projects like the Idea of America, um, our um, electronic field trip uh, series for elementary and middle schools, um, our teacher workshops, and programming for the general public are trying to reach out around the country and get Americans re-engaged with that story, with that great debate, and with the spirit of the American Revolution. So thank you all very much. I appreciate your time this afternoon. And I'm If you, uh, if you have questions, would you pass them outside? They will be collected. I want Jonathan Schulman, who really is the reason for this partnership, to come up and share the questions with me. Um, we have a new category membership, which is for students and military. And one of the first to join from the military, she's in the United States Navy, is Erin Reeves. Stand up, Erin, so we can, you won't miss her, but here's Erin. Mr. Shulman, if you want to bring the questions up, and I'll let you do the first one. Oh, thank you. So the first question is, what American values have gotten out of balance since the 1970s to result in our huge income disparity, and how can it be corrected? I'm not, um, I'm not sure that um, a historian ought to be saying how to correct it. Um, the, um, I, I think, though, that um, when, you, when, you look at the, um, when you look at the history of these things, you recognize the fact that we go through these cycles constantly. Um, the 19th century was a time of great boom and great bust. Um, the people who profited from the boom um, managed to hang on to their winnings, if you will. Uh, the folks who were on the other end of that thing seem to scrape along, um, and, and it's one of the things, quite frankly, that, that, that fuels westward, westward migration. Um, for so many years, it's the fact that you can fail in one community, and you can pick up and move to the next one. You can sort of drop everything, put those things behind you, and move on. Um, so I, I think that, I think that uh, you know, 
in the 20th century, we spent an awful lot of time trying to figure out how to smooth out those boom and bust cycles um, that are so much a part of uh, the American economy. Um, and for the most part, I think we did, uh, we did okay, but not well enough. And um, can we actually manage the economy? Is it actually possible to do? Um, can we actually manipulate these things as a people? And, and uh, that's the discussion that the, that, uh, the Republic has. That's the discussion that uh, is going on now. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how that um, all plays out in the end. This questioner would like to know what was the common demographic of Virginians that emboldened them to be in the vanguard of a revolution? Um, well, the first thing you have to recognize about uh, the demographics of 18th century Virginia is that 50% of the population is in chattel slavery. And so everything that happens in Virginia has an African American's hand touching it. Every leaf of tobacco that goes out of Virginia, every building that's built, every road that's fixed, every person that goes west, everything has an African American's hand touching that thing. And that diversity um, is, um, is interesting, I think, because much of the rhetoric of the revolution has, uh, for Virginians has that notion about freedom and slavery, freedom and slavery over and over and over again. And I think that the fact that these guys know what chattel slavery is helps to fuel that, um, that rhetoric to a, to a great deal. They understand what it means to be enslaved. Um, and they're wrestling with the fact that, um, um, that they are enslavers. Um, so George Mason, for example, um, is, uh, is uh, one of the individuals who, uh, who says something along the lines that slavery makes every master a petty tyrant. Um, he's saying this at the time of the revolution when they're calling the king a tyrant. He's, he's pointing out the fact that he and all of his compatriots are also tyrants and that they need to wrestle with it. They don't do it very successfully, but they, they are discussing it. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think the other thing we have to understand is that um, there is actually here more than 150, almost 150 years of self-government in Virginia and the colonies um, going on. I mean, this, this is not something that just happens quickly. In 1619, they have the first representative assembly. And so from 1619 on, these individuals are representing themselves in some pretty significant ways. They're, make, they're passing their own laws, and yes, they have to go back to Britain. They have to have the assent of the king. But they have this real sense of entitlement, and it's built up over a long period of time. Um, and, and so this notion of self-government isn't really all that radical as far as they're concerned. In many respects, they believe they've been doing it all along. And, and I, think that, I think that long history of representative government in the colonies, not just Virginia, but in the colonies across the board, is uh, one of the things that, uh, that made that moment remarkable. Uh, this question asks about the, uh, the various dichotomies that you have in the great debate. Um, and it asks about what you chose not to include. So why not include the dichotomy of reason versus faith or science versus ideology? Um, Mike Cartunian, who, who's uh, the brainchild between these, um, uh, uh, um, of these uh, value tensions, uh, actually has a, um, standing, um, a standing bet out. He has promised to buy dinner for anyone who comes up with a value tension that he does not believe is assumed by uh, these. Um, uh, these. These were picked, um, picked for a couple of reasons, and, and one of them is that um, they're universal. And every American believes in them, no matter what. Now. I'm not sure that you can say that about the veracity of science, for example, 
or the veracity of faith. And I don't remember what uh, some of the others are. But I mean, that's one of the issues, one of the reasons. And the other is that uh, many of those things are, um, many of those uh, uh, sort of subsets you can pick up and you can integrate into one of these values, ethics, for example. Patrick Henry, Patrick Henry was absolutely convinced that uh, we had to continue with an established church um, in our communities because it was from churches that came ethical values and that without Christian churches you could never have ethical values in your community. He's a product of the 18th century. He's a product of, uh, he's a product of, um, of um, uh, enthusiastic preachers, dissenting preachers of the 18th century. Um, he's got a very old world look when you compare that to a Thomas Jefferson, for example, who believes the government should have nothing to do with uh, the practice of religion. So, I want to do a follow-up question since our Jewish brothers and sisters will celebrate Yom Kippur tonight, to what extent were Jews involved in this uh, discussion and debate? Um, well, actually, to, to a, um, a fairly significant degree, um, and it, it tends to increase as we go through the revolution. Now, um, in, um, in Virginia, um, there is not a large Jewish community. Um, there um, is one um, very prominent a uh, Jew, a uh, doctor by the name of um, De Seguria, um, who's very well known and very well liked and very well engaged in much of these events as you go through. But I think that as the revolution comes on and, and uh, works its way through, um, it becomes very clear that Americans have shifted their focus. And, and probably one of the best um, represents, representations of that is uh, when George Washington, um, not long after his election as president, um, receives a query from um, the uh, Jewish synagogue in Rhode Island. And they're asking if the government, if the federal government um, will support them or will the federal government suppress them. And his response is that every individual in America who gives faith and loyalty to the government of their community, of their state, and the federal government is a citizen of that republic. And that their religion, their faith, has nothing to do with that. Essentially, he's much more eloquent than I am there. But um, it's worth going back to find that letter, to pull it out and take a look at it. Um, because it's a really remarkable statement about, um, about how much thinking has shifted in America about, uh, about um, our diversity. And this will be our last question. Uh, to keep the precarious balance of conflicting ideals, Americans need to be informed and engaged. Why do you think the majority of us presently are no longer truly involved or informed? Um, I don't know that we actually are uninvolved or uninformed. Um, I think um, we are unintentional. Um, I actually believe that this country is shifting into the most democratic era ever in our history. Now you have to understand that the founders were really worried about democracy. I know we use that word a whole lot, but the founders actually, many of the founders actually um, refer to the democracy as mobocracy, okay, and they're worried because the traditional role of the mob in the 18th century is to go burn something down when they don't like, when they don't get what they want. Um, and they're known, 18th century communities are known to do that. They're known to take the law into their own hands. And the founders are very worried about that. They're very worried about what will the role of that mobocracy, the democracy be. Um, that's why we end up with a republic um, and not a democracy um, here in this country. But truth be known, the influence of the individual has, through most of our history, has been relatively small. We're very good in our local communities. That's a place, uh, you know, Jefferson always felt like the local community. That was the place where the republic really lived. 
because that's where individuals gathered together and they knew each other and they talked with each other and they wrestled through the issues of their community. The farther away you got from that, the more difficult it was, um, the worse it was. But you know, today, with digital technology, social media, we form communities instantly across huge, vast distances and form, uh, and form attachments with each other, form attachments and opinions with each other. We have so much information available at our fingertips, right here, right now. The question is whether or not we're going to actually use that stuff and use it intentionally. Whether or not we're going to look at the debate and say, you know, I understand where this person's coming from and where that person's coming from. I understand we're all Americans and we need to figure out how to fit these pieces together. Or whether we're going to um, retreat into the founder's uh, notion of the mobocracy and uh, say to ourselves, you know, let's just take to the streets and go burn something down because we can do it. I think Americans have to be much more intentional, uh, much more thoughtful, and I have a huge amount of faith in the ability of Americans to actually do that. It's why I do what I do. So thank you all very much. Well, there you are. Now all you have to do is study up. And that's so easy uh, to do. I'm grateful to Dr. White grateful to Colonial Williamsburg, grateful to you all. I want to wish you a very great weekend. See you soon.